Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me uh, today on this re-recording of um, a queer talk on queer history um, in the UK for Pride Month at the Herbert Art Gallery. Um, there is some building work outside, so I'm really sorry if you can hear it. It's the only time I've been able to get the time to um, do this. So um, I guess I'll get going. Um, so first of all, um, who am I? <laughs> oh, I'm Nick Cherryman, <clears throat> and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Sociology um, at Warwick University. I look at queer, feminist, and drag theory. Um, and some of you may have seen me before as drag queen IB Profane um, in IB Profane's Drag Through History. That's where this screenshot right here is from. And I also performed at Commentary Pride 2020 in the summer just gone as well. Um, as well as um, I competed at The Yard in Coventry, um, dragged through The Yard, where I got through to the final, but then COVID happened. Um, so it never went ahead, unfortunately, um, the final. I also co-founded and co-convened Queer Disrupt with Hannah Ayres, um, who I would also recommend going and checking out and following um, as well on social media. That's our logo there. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, our Queer Disrupt logo. Um, so yes, give us a follow. So what am I hoping to do with this talk? Well, simply put, there is just no way I can accurately cover all of LGBT history in the space of an hour. It's just that's impossible. So instead, what I've decided to do is pick up on what I think are a few really key events um, and kind of introduce you all briefly to them. Then this isn't to challenge, like openly challenge any of the readings of these events, and I'm not in any way gonna make any sort of claim to objectivity, but instead I'm just hoping to kind of uh, give a small survey, I guess, of quite important queer history. Um, I also want to mention that a lot of history tends to focus on gay male history. Um, and that's not like a choice of me going, I'm going to leave out, for example, trans, bi, lesbian, and other queer histories. It's just that it's more of a case that a lot of these um, histories are focused on men because of misogynism, basically. And um, other areas lack research because of similar problems like trans misogynism or um, trans misogynoir, which is, um, uh, discrimination against um, those who identify as trans, female and black, for example. Um, finally, some of the earlier areas of this talk, I just wanted to sort of point out, I'm quite well indebted to um, the work of Stephen Dryden, Dr. Stephen Dryden, who works at the British Library and does some really amazing work on like audio archives. Um, and I'd really recommend going to like check out his work. Um, and finally, um, just before we get going, really minor content warning. Um, I'm sure you can probably imagine that homophobia has been pretty prevalent in the past. Um, so there are some like rather nasty laws and treatments that we cover, um, as well as just some nasty people, frankly. Um, so I'll try not to dwell too much on really specific uh, cases, um, as there is some like unpleasant stuff. But um, yeah, uh, you're not obliged to watch. Feel free to switch off. Um, I won't take it personally. I probably won't even know. Um, so yes, hopefully we can get going. So I'm just sort out my chair. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with the oh, there we are. Ooh, I'm so we're going to start off with um, the Buggery Act of 1533, introduced by Thomas Cromwell, who a lot of you might be familiar with as the lead character in Hilary Mantle's Wolf Hall series. Um, and yeah, he introduced it, um, this particular act. This was the first civil sodomy law and there was, um, that was there as um, the detestable and abominable vice of buggery committed with mankind or beast, which I can assure you makes the whole thing sound significantly more interesting than the actual act of buggery is. Um, it is followed by like a longer law on salmon, just to give you an idea that like the full length of this law, um, you should hopefully be able to see my um, mouse again. But this one here on the bottom of the left-hand side up to the top of the right-hand side is uh, the law. This whole bit here is all about salmon and goes on to the next page as well. 
However, what it is, you can see there as well, um, salmon at the bottom there. <laughs> um, I've just copied two bits and put them together just for the sake of ease. But what this law did do, however, was codify the fact that if you were convicted of, and it was kind of undefined at this point, acts of buggery against mankind or beast, you'd be subject to, and I'm reading um, from here, the offenders being hereof convicted by verdict, confession or outlawry shall suffer such pains as death and losses and penalties of their good chattels, uh, debts, lands, tenements and hereditaments as felons do according to the common laws of this realm. And now we're down to there. This means basically that not only was the accused killed, uh, but none of their belongings would pass on to their next of kin. Now, this then becomes a punishment that actively hurts everyone surrounding the accused as well. So there's a huge element of um, preventative um, punishment here. This, as a law, essentially remained um, on the books, flitting between like the civil law issue and an ecclesiastical issue. So kind of between like the secular and religious courts, because England was going through monarchs really quickly at this point, and they all had their opinion. But eventually it settled in civil court in 1563 by Queen Elizabeth I. Um, that said, over the next 100 years or so, uh, the evidence suggests that there were very few people actually tried under this. Um, law, despite it being illegal. Although after this kind of period of time, um, prosecutions did kind of start to spike. Um, and there's kind of been a lot of debate as to why that's happened, but the short answer is we aren't 100% sure. Um, it might be that they just, it just didn't happen. Or it might be that if it did, um, a lot of the records were destroyed or expunged. Um, it might be that they are there and just not enough research has gone into discovering them yet. So. It's a really hard one to talk about. I'm going to move forward slightly and then I'm going to jump back. But moving forward slightly, it was ruled that even attempted sodomy was punishable by imprisonment and the billeries, which to make clear is not a light sentence. The brilliant historian Rickerson Norton describes the pillories as involving a public parade from the prison to the pillories, and then the convicted was strapped in and tied up to the pillories themselves. And these are the pillories here that you um, can see that the men tied in as they are in the um, sort of hands and head tied in. Um, you might also know them as the stocks, but I think technically, I might be wrong, technically the stocks are for like your legs and your feet. Anyway, crowds would gather really excitedly and go out of their way to generally make this whole experience as unpleasant as possible. Um, and it would generally fall into like mob rule. People were hit on the way to the pillories um, in that parade from the prison, with stones and bricks in bags, which were known as brick bats. And um, when they were there in the pillories themselves, they would have rotten food, shit, both human and animal, mud and dead animals thrown at them. And for whatever reason, I have no idea why, dead cats appear to be really popular for this as I keep finding records of them being thrown at them. You can actually see here as well in the image at the top, there is an image of a cat. Um, when it was really bad, like when this kind of mob rule got really bad, um, people in the police would have their clothes literally torn off them by the volume of projectiles and the force of it being thrown at them. And it'd be so coated in mud that they would be unrecognizable, sometimes to the point where you couldn't even tell which direction the prisoner was standing. So I include this image here, um, although it's a much later print um, from around 1810, um, just because it kind of highlights the sheer violence of the mob. Uh, this particular image here is of the Veer Street Gang, V-E-R-E, -E, um, who were a group of eight men who were tried under this very law. Um, and given that, they were being, given that they were being prosecuted for being homosexual or technically acts of sodomy, homosexuality isn't legal, just the act of engaging in homosexual acts. This gang gathered an extremely large group of people numbering in the hundreds, if not thousands. This group in particular had 200 police officers protecting 
the men, a hundred of them on horseback. And all of this was just for the six men in the pillories. I know I said there were eight, unfortunately the other two men were hanged. So I'm gonna go back again. And there was that period of time of about a um, hundred years or so I said, where things were quite quiet. What I am going to do is I'm gonna highlight one of the cases we do have of that very small group. There's only about a dozen, I think, um, over that. And this is the trial of the uh, second Earl of Castlehaven, Mervyn Touche, um, who was born in 1593 and died in 1631. Um, and he was definitely amongst the most pro high profile of these cases that were tried. Now, it's unclear how much of this trial was an act of judicial murder, um, where in uh, it's what he claimed his wife and his son were bringing this up against him um, to basically kill him off, essentially, um, and trying to benefit from his estate. Now, I know I said earlier, the law stated that if you're tried under this, you lost all of your estate and everything um, that went on to um, your like next of kin, essentially. Um, but a lot of the uh, Mervyn Touche's um, uh, belongings and, and land was in Ireland. So actually this was an English law, but it still meant from an Irish perspective, his family would benefit greatly from him essentially no longer being around. Anyway, some say that his wife, Anne, um, was having a massive affair and wanted to get his stuff and um, was his, unquote, equal in um, immorality. Now, I want to be really clear here. Um, that was my dog jumping up. I want to be really clear here. Although I don't approve of the treatment of him, even if just some of the accusations against him are true, he was a nasty piece of work, like awful. However, his trial does set a really important precedent in a slightly related field, but, and I'll come back to that, um, which I'll mention in a second. But in short, he was tried for sodomy with two young men who were essentially his favourites by, and this is purely coincidental, <laughs> the prosecutor, Lord Coventry. <laughs> um, but, and this was essentially what he was beheaded for. Um, and he was beheaded owing to his rank rather than, say, hang or something similar. He was killed along with the servant who admitted the crime. And in doing so, I imagine inadvertently doomed himself to death. And also with another man called Giles Browning, who was executed for the rape of Castlehaven's wife. And it was claimed that the Earl of Castlehaven restrained his wife, Anne, to allow this rape to take place. So without dwelling too long on it, I think it's really important to know, I mentioned it, it sets a really important precedent. This was the first case in a British court of law, English court of law, sorry, um, where a wife was able to testify against um, her husband which is really like kind of scary it took this long um and he lost um it was a slim majority though um as not all judging could agree where the actual penetration took place all in all i've spent a while on this because i think it's important to point out this act set a lot of the legal framework for punishing gay men and it highlights this focus on the act of gay sex rather than a gay man or a gay person. And this is a particular rhetoric that sort of carries on today towards particularly homosexual men, but homosexuals generally, um, who are penalized for this kind of specific act rather than them. And a really good modern example to sort of put this in a bit of context would be um, what's referred to as the gay blood ban. Um, whereas the argument is it's not um, homophobic because gay men can give blood, but only if you engage in a homosexual act. A sexual act um, are you limited. Um, in reality, of course, this means that anyone who participates in a kind of sexual relationship, loving, monogamous, whatever, um, is still unable to participate. Now, I'm going to move on swiftly and um, move on from the death penalty acts of sodomy. So at this point, um, buggery, as I said, has been more specifically defined as anal sex between men and anyone, including women, or sex with animals, because apparently that's equal. 
Um, the death penalty remained until the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861, which rendered it punishable by a minimum of 10 years right, imprisonment. Now, this had a really unusual effect, I don't think people were expecting, which meant that a lot more men were no longer being charged for sodomy. Um, it reduced the rate, the rate of um, charging and conviction, given the simple difficulty of proving it in relation to how harsh the sentence was. So to prove sodomy took place would mean that essentially someone would have to catch someone in the act per se, or find evidence of the act taking place, which is kind of <laughs> hard to prove. Um, often they were looking for semen um, to prove that ejaculation took place. Now, on the left here, we have um, two transvestites slash drag queens. Um, they may identify as trans, um, a trans women um, for today, in today's said parlance, but it's very hard to tell. These terms are much more nebulous back then. But they were basically arrested in 1870 um, under the, and I quote, the conspiracy to commit sodomy. So even just the conspiracy here, like conspiracy. They were basically taken to the police station and forced to undergo a really intrusive physical exam. Um, but the charges were ultimately dismissed as there was no evidence. Um, however, even then a large crowd gathered to watch and mock the two as they left the police station. Um, and it was reported in the media at the time as shown by this particular picture here. And if you look at the bottom, it says a retrospect of the Bolton and Park case. Um, and this is from the Illustrated Police News. Now, I won't go as far as to say that these types of cases were common, they were not. But I do think of the cases that did go forward, this is kind of indicative of what would happen. And often it was a social judgment that had a significantly larger effect on those um, accused or convicted, rather than necessarily the judicial um, punishment, um, which would inevitably kind of fall apart given that evidence would not be found for various, various reasons. This is all on about until the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885, um, and in particular, the Le Boucher Amendment, after, named after Henry Le Boucher, he was an MP. Now, this did two things. One, it lowered the sentence um, to up to two years imprisonment rather than 10, with or without hard labor at the discretion of the court, which sounds better than before, right? Until you realize that the, the bar for conviction was now significantly lower. And it means that virtually any act is now punishable. Not only that, even the wording itself of the piece is really prejudicial. And another bit, for example, it says that the term gross indecency isn't even relevant because no one could possibly think that indecency between men could be anything but gross, gross in this sense, meaning um, of really powerful um, import. Um, so even acts such as showing affection could be used as evidence to charge men. And in particular, it was so woolly with its words, it actually became known as, as you can see here, the blackmail charter. As often, um, men would use it to blackmail other richer, um, presumed queer members of society. All you had to do was find a very low bar of evidence and go, I can go to the police unless you pay me money, says the blackmail charter. Now, the most famous victim of the blackmail charter um, was, of course, Oscar Wilde. And I'm sure you've all heard of that. Although summarizing this case will be tricky, I'm going to do it really briefly because I think it raises one of the issues I kind of want to talk about. Oscar Wilde, on the left of that picture, um, was seeing the much younger Lord Alfred Bruce Douglas, who's the one sat down in that picture, who goes by the name Bosey. As Bosey was subsumed into this kind of bohemian and extravagant aesthetic lifestyle of Wilde, Bosey's father, the Marquess of Queensbury, starts blaming Wilde for seducing and indoctrinating his son. So far, so gay. Anyway, a bit of rivalry followed between Queensbury and Wilde, ending when he left a calling card at the private members club, at a private members club called the Al Albemarle. Um, and this is the picture of the actual card here, in which it says, 
for Oscar Wilde posing sodomite. Um, sodomite, it actually says, um, it means sodomite. This essentially was tantamount to a public accusation against Wilde. So Wilde sued for libel against the recommendation of all of his friends. The Marquis of, the Marquis of Queensbury was an extremely powerful person. In short, Wilde lost. But when I read the testimony of the case and the actual transcript, he was basically found guilty primarily through a couple of letters that he sent to Bosey. And I've got some of the, uh, the extracts here. So Gill, who was prosecuting, says to Wilde in court, in letter number one, you use the expression, your slim gilt soul, and you refer to Lord Alfred's red rose leaf lips. The second letter contains the words, you are the divine thing I want, and describes Lord Alfred's letter as being delightful red and yellow wine to me. Do you think that an ordinarily constituted being would address such expressions to a younger man? And Wilde responds in typically Wildean fashion, I am not happily, I think, an ordinarily constituted being, which does get a laugh in the court at the time. Anyway, although it was, let's face it, pretty awful for his case. It's not the kind of time you want to be flippant. Anyway, Wilde was sentenced to two years imprisonment with hard labour. Um, and this is something he never really recovered from. Bosey was, in the words of Hugh Lemmy and Ben Miller, who do um, a fantastic podcast called Bad Gays, which I really recommend. They describe Bosey as an um, archetypal evil twink energy um, to kind of give you an idea of how Bosey was manipulating things behind the scenes here, um, at least from their uh, reading. There's always more to talk about um, with Wild, um, and there's loads of resources online. So I'm going to move on um, because I think they're just going to be better people <laughs> to explore that than me. Um, just before I do, though, I do have a picture of Oscar Wilde's tomb from um, Père Lachaise in Paris. Um, it's a really kind of beautiful graveyard as far as cemeteries or graveyards can be. And there's a lot of famous people in there, for example. Um, Edith Piaf is in there as well. Um, but with Oscar Wilde, um, you can see how much of a kind of figurehead and a martyr he was, um, given his treatment. Um, to the point where they've actually had to put glass protective barriers around his tomb because people kept like writing and kissing um, with lipstick on, um, on the tomb itself. So yes, I think it cost the family quite a lot of money to uphold. <laughs> now, this brings us up to the 1950s quite nicely and I appreciate I've glossed over a lot of the world wars but I just don't have the time to cover all of that there. After the world wars, um, there was a really sharp increase in arrests for homosexual offences, and loads of different sources point to this, but personally I found it quite hard to find like a specific reason to pinpoint, so I think it was kind of a culmination of lots of different things. Um, one of them that I think um, plays a key role is the fact that these cases were under more and more media scrutiny. Um, and they kind of became a bit of a fascination for lots of people in the UK who would kind of follow these stories avidly, much as some people do with soap operas now. Of course, as there was a raise in the media profile, that also became a raise hand in hand um, with um, those pressuring people for a report trying to reevaluate um, homosexuality or acting on homosexual, um, I mean, acts, I guess, um, as a crime. And this came to a head when three aristocratic men were trialed for homosexual acts. We've got Michael Pitt Rivers, Lord Montagu and Peter Wildblood. And Peter Wildblood famously explicitly stated his homosexuality in the courtroom, knowing at this point the kind of danger that um, it would put him in. They were all sentenced between 12 and 18 months in prison. And this trial was kind of instrumental in the following legislature. So in the same year that Alan Turing died, 1954, the Home Secretary at the time, David Maxwell Fife, appointed a department committee on homosexual offences and prostitution in Great Britain, which went under the leadership of Sir John Wolfenden, which is a name you might recognise from, as you can probably see from the title of the slide, the Wolfenden Report. This, com this committee created what is now the Wolfenden Report, um, which was released on the 4th of September 1957. Now, the committee met 62 times over three years. Half of those, so 31 um, of those, were designated for interviewing people. 
The committee consisted of 15 people, 11 men and four women. Now, to give an idea of the kind of environment this was taking place in, to protect the, and I quote, ladies in the room, the words homosexuals and the words prostitutes were actually given code words named after the biscuit band Huntley and Palmers. Huntley for homosexual, Palmers for prostitutes. That's how kind of uh, a, a difficult, risque topic, even just, even just saying the words homosexuals and prostitutes were. However, despite the time for interviews, the committee, unsurprisingly, struggled to find gay men to talk about their experiences, as it would essentially mean outing themselves to have this conversation. Now, this is important because after debating loads of different ideas, including putting an advert in the paper, um, they actually interviewed Peter Wildblood, who was this one, who was just from the previous case, um, as well as two other people, Carl Winter, who was the V&A Museum curator at the time, and Patrick Trevor Roper, who was an openly gay man in an extremely hostile environment. I don't think it can be stressed how important it is that at this time, these three men chose to stand up for their rights. And they managed to help enact a change for literally millions of people since. So what came of all this? Well, all but one of the members of the committee, um, so the 15 of the members of the Wolfenden Committee, stated that, and I quote, homosexual behavior between consenting adults and private should no longer be considered a criminal offense. I hope that by now, I don't have to point out how brave they were, but there was one person in this committee of 15 who disagreed, James Adair. And he was the pro, he was the pro curator fiscal for Glasgow. And he was so appalled that 14 other people um, in the committee said this, that he wrote a really lengthy response against it. Anyway, in the end, with a bit of back and forth, the British government ratified into law the Wolf and Linden's report's findings on in the Sexual Offences Act of 1967. However, owing at least in part to Adair's annoyance, Scotland and Northern Ireland weren't included in this. Um, and as such, people in Scotland would have to wait until 1980 and the Northern Ireland to 1982 before they were afforded the same protections in law. Now, interestingly, and this has never been proved to be an influence, Wolfenden, who is this one here, um, Wolfenden's son was gay and was in his early 20s when the report came out. Now, if Wolfenden knew about his son, isn't entirely clear, but his son was a spy and his homosexuality was known um, to people as the KGB even kind of threatened to utilise it against them. But that's a whole other story and something that is super interesting um, that I can say, go look into. Now, I had to take a really swift detour across the pond for perhaps amongst the most famous of queer events, and that is Stonewall, who I imagine many of you have heard of. Now, I know this talk is primarily British history, but the impact of Stonewall in Britain is too big not to mention. Now, there were other events at Stonewall, before Stonewall, sorry, um, including, for example, the Compton's Cafeteria Riot, and there's a really fantastic document documentary by Professor Susan Stryker called Screaming Queens on that. And there's also the Cooper's Donuts riot as well, which is the first recorded one that took place in 1959, so 10 years before Stonewall. But the most famous is still, without a shadow of a doubt, this um, Stonewall story. Now, traditionally, the story goes that police raided the Stonewall Inn on June the 28th, 1969, the night that Judy Garland bur was buried. So it's very early in the morning on a Saturday. So the, the night, I guess, of um, June the 27th. Spurred on by the collective mourning of the queer community, having lost Judy Garland on the 22nd, um, when the police raided the bar, the community had enough. Now, Marsha P. Johnson or Stormy Delavie or Sylvia Rivera, all of these very popular members of the community at the time were present at the raid. And the story goes that one of them threw a shot glass that smashed a mirror behind the bar. And then this sparked a collective form of resistance against the police in the form of a riot and the rest is history. Basically, the police turned up to raid the bar under the pretense that it's serving liquor without a license. When they got there, many people had kind of been ushered into the street and gathered in the park over the road. And as the police raided the bar, more and more people gathered outside and they started cheering and gathering in quite large numbers. 
the police were clearly getting uncomfortable at the growing crowd. Um, and several of the crowd members um, formed a line and faced off against the police, who were annoyed and arrested some people when they refused to disperse. People then gathered over the next few days, over and over again, outside the inn, and this community spirit is what was the start of the Gay Liberation Front, or the GLF, um, which organized and used this momentum from these um, Stonewall kind of riots to organize the first Pride Marches, which took place on the first anniversary in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York simultaneously. There is a huge amount we can talk about regarding myths and mythologizing around Stonewall, um, and I don't have a lot of time for that, but there is a large amount of discussion um, there are other talks that I've done which do look a little bit more in depth than this. Um, so please feel free to jump on, look on Quidditch's website, and um, you can see there's a, a flashpoint through history where there's a lot of overlap with this one. Um, but I'm going to move on because what I want to get to is the first Pride Festivals in the UK, which took place on the 1st of July 1972, um, three years after Stonewall, but on the nearest Saturday to the event. And this was organized by the UK branch of the Gay Liberation Front, GLF, um, and followed in the footsteps of kind of the US branches. Now, in it, approximately 1,000 LGBTQ plus folk basically rocked up and marched to Trafalgar Square for a kissing. Now, remember, only a few years before this was homosexual acts legalized in the privacy of their own home. So to say that this is revolutionary um, sorry, five years before I said three, um, revolutionary is undeniable. Um, and I guess what I want to draw out here is how the effects like Stonewall can have this kind of ripple effect around the world. So what I actually thought was quite a very small uprising in the bar, which was no different from many other uprisings before. This one just kind of really captured the, the public imaginary and turned into a massive like, uh, kind of movement around the world. I want to take a look at the GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, very briefly. Um, they disbanded after just three, year, three years, so it's extremely short-lived. However, it's also impossible to overstate the importance of this movement as well. And I would argue that they are at least on par with, and probably even higher than Stonewall on important issues in queer history. Many of the activists that were involved in the Gay Liberation Front went on to do some really impressive things. Notably, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera in the US, who started up um, a group called Star Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Um, but over in the UK, we had the likes of uh, Peter, Peter Tatchell, um, who's quite well known even today um, as an LGBT and social rights activist. And there are other academics um, and other people, such as Simon Watney, who went on to form groups such as Outrage. Again, there's many, many more things that the GLF did and primarily it acted as the first rallying point for many activists who went off and formed their own separatist groups afterwards. Things such as the pride parades, however, that happen around the world yearly just simply would not have happened without the Gay Liberation Front. Um, and as recently as 2019, the Gay Liberation Front rebanded together at Pride UK. Now I'm gonna move on again for the purposes of brevity. Um, and I'm gonna look at the HIV AIDS crisis in the 80s in the UK. The first reported case of AIDS in the UK was in 1981. HIV, which develops into AIDS, was originally referred to, albeit extremely briefly, as GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. However, it was more commonly and colloquially known in the media in particular as the gay plague, the gay cancer, gay pneumonia, etc. And it was never called GRID um, in actual medical journals, as it was pretty evident it didn't affect only gay men. But this association with gay men and this gay plague remained. The UK government was using these very alarming, albeit quite effective, ads involving giant black monolithic tombstones with AIDS, how we can see on the left here, and things like don't die of ignorance kind of emblazoned across them. And when I first did this talk, um, I mentioned to my mum I was talking about this, and um, she mentioned uh, my brother when he was four, which would be in 1984, um, and he was very ill with measles, um, and he didn't really understand what was happening when he was four. 
But my mum vividly remembers him asking her, am I going to die of AIDS? Now I tell that story only to kind of really kind of emphasize the atmosphere that was pressing down on people in the UK in the early mid eighties. And there really was this kind of, this, this, this sense of fear that permeated a lot of society. The adverts from the government would say things like, if you ignore this, it could be the death of you. Now, undoubtedly, the AIDS crisis ravaged the gay community, not only in the UK, but around the world, in both its very real physical effects, but also its social effects that led to ongoing ostracization and discrimination against gay men and other queer bodies. Um, this is, for example, very recently, um, at the time of recording, being covered in It's a Sin by Russell T. Davis, which I haven't started to watch just yet, um, but I'm planning to very shortly. Um, mainly because a lot of people have said it's extremely hard hitting and with everything else going on, I, I need a break um, and I want to make sure I've got the time to kind of process it all. Um, I will hopefully though be releasing a podcast on this with Hannah Ayers, my co convener for Quit Disrupt, um, once you've both gone through it. There's also been a lot of really interesting discussions as well and what, if any, similarities there are between COVID and the HIV slash AIDS crisis. And as a community that's been ravaged by illness before, the question is raised, do queer people relate differently to COVID than non-queer people? So to give an example, I really recently helped judge a queer art competition for works created in response to and in the time of COVID. And one of the entries was rhetorically called, if I'm not afraid of getting AIDS, why should I be afraid of COVID? And this was a theme that came up a lot in the entries. I'm not going to dwell on that, but I, I just wanted to really highlight this kind of similarity of, of thought that is particularly going through a lot of queer communities at the minute. I also want to mention briefly one of the first victims of AIDS in the UK, here on the right, um, who was a young man named Terry Higgins, who died on the 4th of July 1982. AIDS had only been identified the previous year, which made Terry one of the first people in the UK to have um, died with um, AIDS um, recorded as a cause of death. In response to his death, his partner and close friends set up a trust to raise funds for research to present suffering for those living with HIV and AIDS under his name, the Terry Higgins Trust. Later, this was formalized into the Terence Higgins Trust, and they are now Europe's biggest HIV and AIDS charity. And the name Terence Higgins was chosen as an attempt to humanize those who live with the disease in this climate sphere and Terry himself is now obviously this namesake of enormous charity. The late 80s also brought with it something that has become something of a bogey man in the LGBT community, courtesy of Margaret Thatcher's Tory government, Section 28 in 1988. Now, this particular piece of legislation states, and you can follow along here, that local authorities shall not intentionally promote um, homosexuality or publish material with the intention of promoting homosexuality or promote the teaching in any maintained school of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. This was passed at the height of homophobia in the UK with 1987 showing a peak in negative attitudes towards homosexuality particularly following the years of really negative media portrayals in relation to AIDS, as discussed earlier. In 1987, and this is just to kind of give you a scale of, of the homophobic um, attitudes. In 1987, the British Social Attitude Survey showed that 75% of British people stated that they felt homosexuality was always or mostly wrong, with only 11% saying it was never wrong. To give a comparison, 16% in 2018 said it was always or mostly wrong, with 66% saying it was never wrong. Now, I'm not trying to say that these numbers are good. I think 16% of people three years ago saying that homosexuality is always or mostly wrong is still horrifically high, and only 66% saying it's never wrong is horrifically low, but it does highlight the scale of difference compared to now back then. And I think it's often very easy to lose sight of how much attitudes have changed. Now, this legislation was undeniably homophobic, Section 28. 
And without question, it was spurred on by the level of prejudice against homosexuality from the general public. This was not without controversy though. And the night before the vote, four lesbians invaded the six o'clock news drawing the bulletin and handcuffed themselves to the desk and news camera chanting, stop section 28. They were taken away by police and eventually released without charge. Um, you can see all of this unfurl, by the way, really easily if you just search on Google lesbians invade BBC, which I think is a search term we should all be using more often because I think it's hilarious. Um, and this led to really kind of general amusement at the time. Um, it, I mean, it, was, it wasn't regarded as serious. It was kind of a tongue in cheek, oh, look what those quirky lesbians are doing kind of attitude, um, rather than actually acknowledge the real damage that something like Section 28 was doing. Um, and led to headlines like Beeb Man Sits on Lesbian. Now, Section 28 has been repealed and was repealed in 2003 to four. But looking at what this did at the time is interesting. The act itself undeniably had an effect, even if no one was actually prosecuted or challenged for breaching the, the, the act. Um, I do have another talk on this, which talks much more in depth on section 28. Um, one of the key problems being that homosexuality actually doesn't have a legal definition, but it was used legally. Um, and we get back to the same old debate between homosexuality and acts of homosexuality, which led to this really big kind of discussion about what does home promoting, what does promoting mean, what does homosexuality mean um, when talking about section 28. But because it was so vague, given this, what happened is many schools, for fear that they would be targeted or unintentionally crossing that boundary, which is kind of undefined, um, it meant they rolled back on any discussion of homosexuality and homosexual relationships. This was also supported by some really, really abhorrent comments by some then MPs, such as Conservative MP Peter Brune Bells, commenting, and I quote, and I have heard this actual recording. Um, so um, when I first read this quote, I thought it was so horrific. I thought it must have been taken out of context. It is not. And he says, I do not agree with homosexuality. I think that Clause 28 would help outlaw it and the rest will be done by AIDS with a substantial number of homosexuals dying of AIDS. And I think that's probably the best way. I don't really have much more to say about that. I think that something, it's like that quote, isn't it? You know, when someone tells you who they really are, listen to them. I think this does that quite well. Anyway, this galvanized gay rights movements in the UK, Section 28. Um, as it gave a really specific target of focus for many groups that had fragmented over time um, with all these different aids since like the Gay Liberation Front and Pride marches. The most famous of these is now the really well-known Stonewall charity, named after the events of Stonewall that I mentioned above. And this was created as a direct response to Section 28 by actor Ian McKellen, who came out of the closet because of this, um, and other people such as Lisa Power and Lord Cashman. Ironically, despite this very real effect in schools in an attempt to quash any normalization of non-normative relationships, the response has been instead to cause an explosion of charitable causes. And now there are some really powerful charities lobbying for LGBTQ plus rights. So the queer community pulled together in the face of this act, um, which I argue came, come, came, bleh, came to represent <laughs> Um, this long history of homophobia in British politics. So Section 28 became a symbol of not only the ongoing discrimination in political discourses surrounding LGBT rights, but also emblematic of the Tory party as this supposed nasty anti-gay party, quotation marks. So while Stonewall, the actual act, uh, the actual riot, sorry, was for example, uh, a symbol for people to rally behind, Section 28 became a symbol um, for people to rally against. So both help bring about really important LGBT plus rights movements in the UK, but for very different reasons. Now I'm gonna move on to what Coventry has done recently. Um, but before that, I wanna mention that um, section 28 was repealed after 15 years in 2003 and four, with one attempt um, um, for it to be repealed being rejected in the year 2000 in what then future prime minister Theresa May called, and I quote, a victory for common sense. The age of consent for homosexual couples was lowered in 16, 
lowered to 216, sorry, the same um, as for heterosexual couples in 2001. Um, I actually remember that in school, I was in year seven, and I actually remember this, like I remember hearing about that. And as someone coming to terms very gradually at that time with my uh, homosexuality, I remember being kind of confused and not really understanding how important that was at the time. Uh, and much as I lambasted the act of 1885, the one that Oscar Wilde was convicted under, the blackmail charter, I also want to kind of use this to kind of point out that um, this opportunity that had this act never happened, the age of consent would have remained at 13 in the UK. So much as I find the codification into law um, homophobic um, and homophobia abhorrent, I can't help but feel there's a whole thing that's really complicated going on. And it can be really easy sometimes to minimize and constrict various uh, parts of queer history into neat little bundles um, as kind of discrete articles. And actually they don't, there's much more interlapping. I'm not gonna pass comment on particularly the blackmail chart and the things I've just mentioned there, but I just, again, I want to kind of highlight the kind of really complicated nature um, and systems and webs that everything's intermingled in, um, in uh, history and particularly queer history. Um, so, on to Coventry. What has Coventry done in these past few years? Well, there's a few things I can cover here. But unfortunately, Coventry doesn't have as much obvious queer life as cities such as Birmingham, which obviously benefits from a much bigger populace. However, that's not to say there isn't a small queer history in Coventry and one that isn't growing rapidly. So there's some really obvious things to talk about and some less obvious things to talk about. So I'm going to start with the obvious, rainbows. Rainbows opened on the 1st of May 1997 and was primarily the centre of gay and queer culture in Coventry until it closed on New Year's Day in 2018. It hung around through thick and thin for 20 odd years and there were other gay bars that opened over the years but they tended to close quite quickly. Rainbow stayed put. It won several awards over its 20 years, including Zone Magazine's Best Bar Outside of Birmingham. And I was speaking to a friend about this, um, someone who um, has a bit more life experience. Um, I think they'll appreciate me phrasing it that way. Um, they used to say that Rainbows was heaving. Um, there was a hotel nearby, which they remember, and I'm quoting here as, the F1 hotel where I could stay for 19 quid that could sleep up to three friends. <laughs> end quote. Rainbows closed a few years back, of course, but was soon replaced um, with Glamorous, um, a sister venue of the Glamorous Bar in Birmingham. And Glamorous um, reopened in the same building as Rainbows, um, as, um, and I call it semi-affectionately, as Rainbows with a Lick of Pain. Um, otherwise, other bars in Cobb, I'm just thinking of, um, there was, for example, Kiki's in Earlston Street, which was a queer cocktail bar, which closed quickly, and there were others, I think there was one in the train station that closed really quickly. But one bar that did kind of step up and take the mantle from Rainbows, however, is The Yard, which opened on June the 9th, 2017. And it was kind of touted as this new space for LGBT people. Um, and it has a place near the train station in the bull yard in the city centre. I won't big up a lot, but I do like it there quite a lot. Um, it's become a massive fixture of nightlife in Coventry and is one of the more popular bars in the city centre. They win a lot of awards, um, which is good, and they regularly host kind of big events. They've had some performers there, such as Sonique, uh, Charlie Hyde from Drag Race, um, and lots of local queens perform there on the regular. It was actually where I first went out in drag, and I know I'm not in drag right now, but um, I do sometimes give lectures and talks in drag. Um, more recently, but pre-lockdown, the Yard have been putting on big shows such as their Summer of Love party. And I've also played a role in, in Cov Pride, um, particularly over the past few years, hosting the Pride festivals in that kind of space outside there. Um, if we look here in where the, uh, the cursor is, in that big space there. Um, it, their last Pride was actually done in lockdown um, and it was done from the stage in the yard, streamed out live. And these are a couple of pictures for me doing this. Um, and it was great fun. As you can see, it was an empty bar and it was me 
cameraman and one person right at the back. Um, and if it is still available online, if you do happen to see it, you can hear um, as someone who does stand up comedy for the act, it's really hard to do stand up comedy to an empty bar. Um, but I did, and it was great fun, and I'm really grateful for the yard for sign giving me that opportunity. But they were not the first place um, to hold Pride. The first Pride Festival in Coventry took place on the 13th and 14th of June 2015, and it was in Fargo Village. And I remember going, and it had stalls, events, and a burlesque evening, um, burlesque show in the evening, featuring the now quite well-known founder of uh, Trans Creative, which is a theatre group in Manchester, um, Kate O'Donnell. Over the weekend, about 6,000 people attended, with most on the Saturday, I think it was about 4,500, so about three quarters on the Saturday, um, which is kind of impressive, as it was mainly put together last minute after the original organisers of the festival had a complete breakdown in working relations and it very nearly got cancelled. I remember even just a couple of weeks before going, oh, what's happening with the Pride Festival that's meant to be going on? And um, people just from Fargo being like, I have no idea anymore. <laughs> um, instead, what did happen was Fargo Village and LGBT event groups in Coventry worked together to make it happen. Um, and they did, and it was great. Uh, the following week, the organizers said that it was so successful and had such good feedback that they would be putting um, together another one for next year. And they ended up registering Coventry Pride, the charity, so they were able to fundraise for the event throughout the whole year. Of course, I've mentioned the festivals and the venues, um, but there's a few other little bits and pieces I would love to draw attention to in the most recent years. I want to point out the Coventry Corsairs Rugby Club for one, um, and that's them here. Um, the uh, they are sponsored by The Yard, you can see on there, and this photo I believe is in The Yard on the stage where you saw me earlier. You can see some of the drag queens there. Um, that's uh, uh, Minerva Saturno, and that's Jupiter um, Saturno. Um, regular queens at The Yard, they're brilliant, I really recommend them. Um, and the rugby club founded in 2019. They started this year, 2021, has become the newest associate member of international gay rugby. And they are the 91st group um, in the world to join. And it includes groups from Germany, Australia, United States, and so on. Um, I heard they even let in a group from Birmingham, which, oh, shocking. That was a joke. Uh, the Corsairs are a fully inclusive team, um, allowing anyone who identifies as LGBTQ plus to join. And I kind of wanted to highlight them specifically as it's often extremely difficult to overcome phobia. Um, in sport and rugby is often seen as an overly masculine and like heterosexual sport so I do think these LGBTQ plus sports groups in particular um, do make a real difference for a lot of people. With that said I wish them all the best because having weighed up all the pros and cons um, of being squashed between a bunch of men and squeezed between some muscly well-toned thighs I have decided that I would watch and enjoy from the sidelines. You can tell I have no idea how to play rugby, can't you? <laughs> and I've made my peace with that. I'll just watch. But it's not just sport and social activities that Coventry do really well. They are providing a lot of support groups um, for those who need it. Um, and a couple that I know off the top of my head, and I'm sure there are many more, so apologies if I, I, I just miss loads, um, include PRISM, which is for young LGBTQ plus people. Um, Ego Performance Company, which specializes in diverse representation theater, including LGBTQ plus people, um, as well as many others. Um, Coventry Warwickshire Friends Support, um, which uh, do networking and counseling and friendship for those in the LGBT community. There's You Are Not Alone, which is a fortnightly trans coffee group. There's also Out in the UK, which is a refugee support group for LGBT members. Um, it goes on. Um, I also want to refer to some of the work being done at local universities. Um, and I'll be the first to put my hands up and say, I don't know a huge amount of the career research going on at Coventry Uni, and I, I, I should do better, frankly. Um, but at Warwick, I know we are really at the forefront of like a lot of um, career research. Um, 
And uh, Warwick uh, is also at the forefront of lots of other groups, such as the um, they played a key role in organizing Campus Pride um, 2020, which went over, I think it was over 40, or I might mean even 50 other universities putting on a whole series of events um, online, which is great. The group Queer Disrupt here, um, which is partially what this is uh, this talk is through, um, is the one that I co-founded and I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, we're formed by a lot of early career researchers looking at queer history, and then we branched out into broader queer themes and engagements. And we have now in less than a year of being formed, um, had talks and events ranging from like the purely academic to workshops we have an upcoming international conference to like massive takeovers of art festivals such as the shout festival um, which took place on the 20th of uh february and some of those recording will be going out um at the time of recording i think they'll be going out in the next couple of days but i imagine they'll be out by the time you see this um and we've been really fortunate given all of this um considering the fact the world's kind of gone to hell in a handbasket over the past year um so i think there is a lot of growth in community um, locally. Um, and I kind of just want to end uh, this talk by returning to the point I made at the beginning of this section. Um, and Coventry historically has not had a particularly vibrant queer scene or LGBTQ plus scene. But what I do hope I've managed to kind of highlight is that this is growing and growing really quickly. Um, and I really hope this kind of gives you a little bit of a spark of joy and hope for where the queer scene in Coventry is going in future years. And the speed it's happening is kind of incredible. Like looking back over queer history in the UK, you can see that change happened at often glacial paces, sometimes taking decades and centuries at times. So the point to point out everything that happened in Coventry in just say the past five years and the growth we've had since then is kind of amazing. I'll stop there. And um, I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, I've probably gone on a little bit too long now. Um, it was originally 45 minutes. Um, I've slowed down a lot from when I first recorded it and added a few little tiny bits in there. So it's near an hour. Um, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop us a line. And many, many thanks.